Welcome everybody to today's Building My Legacy podcast. I have with me today, Reg Regev Parkish. We'll call you Reg for short, as you suggested that I do. So he is an executive coach, an aspiring politician, and um, he has worked with a number of companies um, in, in, with Prudential Insurance, NatWest, Business Hub, Hello Foods, Aldermore Bank, and the Women's Economic Forum, Delhi. So he comes with a breadth of experience working with executives, both as a coach and a consultant, looking at um, how do you achieve high performance and build high performance teams. He has gone through a number of different backgrounds and perspectives in coaching, and he is going to talk with us about one of them today, which is um, all about free, uh, the free principles of coaching and living. So if you would share a little bit about that and give us some examples of why you've gone in that direction, why that as a concept, and um, what do you do with it? Sure, Lois, thank you uh, very much for the invite. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'm glad to be a guest in your podcast, I'm sure amongst many other uh, incredible guests. I've set the standard pretty high. But um, yeah, so the three principles. Wow, you know, why I've been so warm to the principles is mainly because what they've helped me to achieve, what they've given me, which is high performance. You know, for me, my passion was high performance. It's what I do as a coach. It's what I love helping my clients with. And it's why I got into coaching because many years ago, I struggled with my own mental health. I struggled with um, my own well-being as, um, as a child. So the principles and the work I do as a coach is all geared towards high performance. Now, when we're talking about what high performance is, the principles showed me something different to how I've normally known life works. So let's just say if someone's struggling with high performance and they're saying, my confidence has taken a knock, what I'm really struggling with is confidence. That's what stopped me from being a high performer. Right. A lot of traditional personal development and techniques might be, okay, well, let's, let's go in and fix this. How can we give you more confidence? How can we, here's a couple of strategies. Now, I used to do a lot of that and it was great at the time and sure, it gave me a bit of a boost. But then what I noticed is I constantly needed to do that again and again. And it felt a little bit artificial to me. I was doing all these techniques to try and feel confident. And it works somewhat, but what made a huge difference is when I came across the principles. And what they imply is something like confidence isn't a cause, it's a symptom. It's something a symptom, like okay, yeah. Lack of motivation is a symptom. Something like procrastination is a symptom. So if I give you a great example of confidence, I remember I was coaching a lady once on public speaking, and she said, Rag, I've got confidence problems. And I said, well, tell me more. And she said, I'm really scared about going on stage. And I asked her a little bit about this. And she said, well, before I go on stage, I keep telling myself that what if I fail? What if I collapse? Call the ambulance. She has this narrative going through her mind. Now, you could try and give her confidence tools to fix that. But what occurs to me is if she recognizes that she's just doubting herself, she's experiencing her own thinking. If she recognizes that, and we do a lot less of that, what happens is you don't really have confidence problems anymore. You feel more naturally confident. And it just then dawned on me that confidence is something we already have until we get in our own way of it. High performance is something we have inbuilt, intrinsically inbuilt, until we get in our own way. Like I do so many things through my day, with confidence, without thinking about it. But when there's something that comes up, like a public talk, then we start questioning ourselves. We get in our own way of performance. We start thinking, what if I fail? What if I fall over? What if I, what if, what if? And it's exactly the same thing with any conversation, whether it's uncertainty, whether it's self-esteem, whether it's focus, that we actually have a lot of that inbuilt through our day we do hundreds and thousands of tasks with such ease and flow and, and performance, like we're in the zone, like an athlete. 
who's in the zone performing. Now, the only thing that will stop an athlete from performing is when they get caught up in their head and they start questioning everything they're doing and it becomes harder. And that's what I love about the principles that it showed me you can succeed in an easier way. You can perform in a way that's more smooth, more you know, superfluous, more easier, more relaxed. And it's less about all the things you now need to do. It's about not getting in your own way when you're doing something. And that was profound. I never thought of it that way, that actually I am naturally confident. I used to think because I have these fears, because, oh, I need to be confident. And I realized, well, I'm just getting in the way of my natural confidence. In fact, confidence doesn't even exist. We don't need confidence. We need to just not get in our own way when we're doing something. And the results are just amazing. So the pressure has massively gone down. There's so much less emphasis on all the things I need to change and do and develop myself and become this person. And actually, if I'm just not getting in my own way, then things are so much easier. I just perform better. So that's a glimpse of the principles. So how do you get out of your own way? Because I think may think that it conceptually it can work but we do get in our own way so how do you how do people stop getting in their own way well i'll share if i can share a quick example with you so i Please. remember i was doing a talk for the government in the uk and i'm allowed to talk about this this is highly confidential or anything but i was delivering a talk on resilience to to the government and parts of parliament. And for them, they're really big on resilience because they're going through times of uncertainty. And I use a great example about roller coasters. And I said, what's the scariest part of going on a roller coaster? Because I'm not a fan of roller coasters. I'm not a fan at all, I can't stand them. And a lot of them said, well, surely it's when you're on the ride or when you're going down the, whatever, the, the track. But one person said, actually, Rag, I think it's when we're in the queue. And suddenly everyone murmured and thought, yeah, yeah. And I said to the guys, the scariest part about being on the roller coaster isn't even the roller coaster. It's what we think about the roller coaster. And what that shows me is as humans, we have the ability to think. And we often think quite a bit. As the philosopher Descartes said in one of his meditations, I think, therefore I am. Right that we experience thought. We have the creative ability to think as people. Now, why they found that profound is they were talking about how to manage uncertainty. Well, here's the thing. We all deal with uncertainty because uncertainty isn't the bad, scary, horrible part. It's what we make up about uncertainty that's scary. It's what we're telling ourselves about uncertainty that's scary. That's what is the most horrific part. It's not actually what's unfolding because we can deal with that in real time as it happens. You know, okay. you and me, I'm sure we've been through challenges in our lives and businesses. And when they come up like a fire would, a firefighter can just put it out in the moment, on the spot. They can deal with it. But why we get stuck is because we get a little bit caught up in our thinking about how will something happen? What if this will happen? And we you can call it self-doubt. You can call it questioning yourself. You can call it criticizing yourself. All of that just keeps us a little bit in our heads and stops us from being responsive and creative and focused and in the zone and doing the things in our life that we can do. Now, some people can call it mindfulness. Some people might call it a meditative state of performance. Like you see when you watch an actor acting or a sports person performing. But why I talk about it in this way, that is not something so much you have to do versus that can actually be your natural default. That way of performing, that way of doing things, that way of living, that can be your own natural default. Like the same way you watch a movie at the cinema, you just get into the zone, you enjoy it. When you're going for a nice walk, you get into the zone and you enjoy it. Now you might feel nerves when you're public speaking, but that experience is, can be the same. You can still get into the zone despite the nerves and have a better performance. So getting into the zone, getting out of your head so you can let what your natural talent is come forward. Oh, how do you do that? That's a process, correct? So 
yeah so my understanding of how do we get out of our head is um if i think about a conversation right now we're naturally in the flow and we're just having a conversation and it's really easy and it's quite simple and we often ask well how do i get out of my head i look at it the other way that i think we're out of our head until we get in our head where we use thoughts as a ladder and we start climbing all these thoughts that come from mind like some of my clients call it what if thing that a lot of their fears in business and life come from what if like what if this happens in my life what if this happens what if and as that level of thinking doesn't actually help because it's not contributing to us navigating a disaster it's not contributing to us overcoming a potential challenge. That's just getting us very caught up in our own fear. And if you look at, so to look at how do we not get caught up in that, it's like the act of meditation. Why people like meditation and they think meditating is what helps them slow down. Well, when you're meditating, all you're doing is stopping and doing nothing and you're relaxing. And that brings you back to your own default that brings you back to a grounded state because you're letting go. You're not actually doing anything when you meditate. And I never thought about it that way. I thought I need to do meditation so I can be relaxed. And until I realized I might feel stressed from time to time, but if I allow myself to slow down, if I allow myself to be grounded, I suddenly feel more inspired. I feel more creative. I get better ideas. Like a great question to ask my clients who are a little bit skeptical about this first, I'll ask them the question, where do you get your best ideas from? And all of them will say in the shower, when I'm walking a dog, one of those two, it's often one of those two answers. And I ask them, what do you make of that? And they'll say, yeah, well, I tend to get my ideas and creativity when I'm relaxed. Because we perform better in that state. But we think we need to be stressed and hustling and burning ourselves out and we wear burnout like a badge of honor like it's i need to be stressed i used to have this belief you know uh, no pain no gain I, right. I need to be working hard i need to stress myself out well if you look at the body or the mind most things in life don't work well when you put incredible amounts of stress it's not the nature of it like sure some things you will experience stress in life it's normal but a lot of the excess we put on ourselves, that's why we think, how do I then ground myself? When actually grounding yourself is our nature, but we take ourselves away from grounding. So I can see how that applies to speaking. I can see how it applies to um, moving into a new activity or task, presenting, uh, developing a plan. How about procrastination? How does that work with procrastination? Because that's a little bit different mental process, or is it not? Well, it's different, and well, without giving you the annoying answer, it's different and it's similar. So it's okay. different in the sense the symptom looks different, like a cough and a cold look different, but they can come from not looking after your health. So as well as it being a natural thing. So if we look at procrastination, I was coaching a great uh, a client on this, and it's a great example. And they said, Rag, well, what about the things I don't like? Okay. And I said, what about them? They said, well, there's things in my business I don't like to do. Now, I'll give you a great example, like taxes. It's this time of the year where we've got to pay our taxes. Do I like paying taxes? Well, I like it in the sense that I think I'm grateful I have a business where I can pay taxes. I'm succeeding in this way. Fantastic. But back then, I never liked I didn't enjoy paying taxes, spending five hours going through the process, doing my accounts, but that didn't stop me from doing it. I still did it. And when we look at procrastination, why we procrastinate isn't because something isn't our passion or isn't because we don't love it. We don't have to love everything we do. Otherwise, no one would get anything done. Why we procrastinate is when we get on our heads and we say, well, I could do my accounts, but I don't like it and it's going to take long. And it's going to be overwhelming and this and that. And we have so many stories that our body just feels overwhelmed. And that's what overwhelm is. When we get so caught up in all the things we think we have to do, that our mind feels busy. And instead of being focused on the one thing, we're just so overloaded. It's like the experience of when you 
are having a nice lunch and you know you're full, but the food's so good, you think I need a bit more, right? We're all guilty of that. Your body's overwhelmed and it has to relax and just shut off. That's what procrastination is. It's a symptom from focusing on anything but the task at hand. It's focusing on anything but the task at hand because when we're procrastinating, we're telling ourselves how hard it's going to be, how stressful it's going to be, how ugly it might be, how hideous. If you're doing that, why would you then feel inspired to do what's in front of you? Whereas when it comes to my accounts, it doesn't matter what I think of it. And this is the thing. I don't go off the, my feelings. I don't go off my thinking because that will pass. Sure, I might have the thought saying I don't like it. I don't need to take that thought seriously. I don't need to get so immersed in how I'm feeling. I can just not take my feelings and thoughts seriously. And I can just plow on with what's in front of me. So you, do you do that by creating a new story or how do you go about that, Ray? You know, when I feel it's, it's, I feel all the same thoughts and feelings my clients will feel. But the difference being now is I know that's what they are. They're my thoughts and feelings. Like if I have the thought, oh, I really don't like my accountants and I don't want to do this and I don't want to. My thoughts and feelings aren't really a good indicator of what something's going to be. My thoughts and feelings really aren't a great indicator of how or what is happening in front of the world or in the world in front of me. They're not reliable as an indicator. They're not a GPS to go off. And why we struggle is we go off our thoughts and feelings. We go off them saying, you know, oh, the, this is going to be difficult or this, this new task in my business is going to be monotonous. It will, well, what will happen is whatever thoughts we have, when we're not so caught up in our thoughts, we end up just going with our own common sense. You can call it intuition. Entrepreneurs like to call it intuition. Their own instincts, their own common sense. And you start taking one step and the next and you build flow, you build momentum. So our goal is never to change our thinking. And I tell my clients this because that keeps you more on your thinking. You're trying to change your thinking. My job in soul process is to recognize that we experience our thoughts, but it's not a problem. We all experience thoughts. We all have times of self-doubt. But in the same way, when someone comes up to me and gives me an opinion of how I should do stuff, or someone in your world has got an opinion and you just know it's not right, we just don't do anything with it. We ignore it. We go, okay, thank you, but I'm just going to carry on. That's the same process. That I just don't go off my thoughts and feelings. We're all human like everybody. But it's like exams. If you're going to go into an exam and you're feeling nervous, you know you've got to do the exam. So you just ground yourself and you do the exam regardless. It's less about the thought and feeling. And I think we live in a world where we think we shouldn't feel a certain way when we make it personal. Oh, I shouldn't be feeling this way. Or I'm feeling nervous is a problem. Or I'm, and I say to my clients, no, that's normal. And when you can normalize it, there's less of a need to change it. Like when you recognize everyone has a cough and a cold, you just don't feel as bad when you have a cough and a cold. You rest, you take it easy. And that's the same process with this. That it's normalizing that we think. Right. Okay. So I get that. Because breathing. I get that. And I'm still struggling a little bit, Reg, with, so how do you internalize this? So how do you um, shift and let your natural state emerge and shut off the stories that are putting you either in stress, overwhelm, loss of confidence, procrastination, whatever. So there has to be something that you do in order to get your feet grounded to be in the natural state. And what, what is that? So what, what really helped me understand this a little bit better is when I looked at the science behind how our minds work and how, brain, how our brains work. And I was blown away by the stats that we have 90,000 thoughts a day. 90,000. And why that's impressive is it shows me that we're not the ones processing our thoughts. That's what our brain does. That's the, the capacity of our own. I call it our own intelligence. That the same intelligence that when we get 
injured or when we hurt ourselves and when we feel unwell, our main job is to rest. And somehow we get back to full health very quickly without us doing the heavy lifting within whatever. In the same way, I look at that with our thinking that I don't actually think it's our job to address our thinking. So we have 90,000 thoughts a day. If I try to change every story of thought in my head, I wouldn't get anything done in the day and it would be exhausting. And why we are exhausted is because I think that's our own system saying we're spending way too much time trying to do stuff with our thoughts, which is where overwhelm comes from. So it's, and there's all these you know, techniques you can do and you can do breathing, you can do all these other techniques to slow yourself down. But in the same way, I don't do anything to process those 90,000 thoughts. I have them, but I know they're going to pass in its own way. It's just like the weather. I know it's going to rain, but I don't need to do anything to change the rain. Now, if I try and I go into the rain, I'm going to get wet. That's what overwhelm is. When you have the thought and you jump into the puddle of this thought and you get muddy and wet. Whereas what I know is if I just stay on the course, I'm going to have one thought, then I'm going to have another thought, then I'm going to have another and another. And that's what self-doubt is. Self-doubt is just a thought. It's like as much as, oh, I'd love to have a sandwich for lunch. Oh, what if I fail? It's that we take the what if I fail thought more seriously. We spend more time focusing on the what if I fail thought, whereas all the other thoughts such as, yeah, I'd like to see my friend today. I'd like to go and all those thoughts come and go so quickly because we love them. But we have this what if I fail thought or what if I something thought or what if I get stuck? And we have the thought and we don't recognize it's our thoughts. We think it's real. And it's because we're spending so much energy there, that's why we get stuck. Whereas if we let that thought pass, which is going to pass, by the way, every listener on this um, audio, whatever they're listening to now, it's probably not the thought they had an hour ago. Whatever they're thinking now is a different thought to what they thought a minute ago. That our nature is that we experience thoughts rapidly that come through us and change without our intervention. I hope so, that makes a bit more sense. Yeah, it does. So what, are, what do you suggest to people as um, they work on, they work, it's getting back to that state where they're in their natural state. What do you suggest to people in order to help them get to that state so they can let their natural thoughts come forward? This is going to sound like an like a absolutely crazy question, but it's led to really profound insights from my clients that I would invite people just to think about, what if it wasn't your job to ever change your thinking again? What would happen? Now, when I throw this question out there, I don't also, also throw this question saying it's a catch all for mental health because I've been privileged to have a lot of coaches. I've worked on my own mental health. I believe I'm an ambassador for mental health. There's a number of things people can do. So this isn't a, this isn't a lightly or me lightly making a statement. This is all you have to do because people might need different ideas and, and it's going to be personal. And I let their, their own personal instincts guide them on this. But if we look at this as a first step per se, a question I ask my clients is what would happen if you didn't make it your job to change your thinking again? What would happen? And at first, I get responses like, well, I'm worried I'd be more caught up in my thoughts or I'd be more stressed or something. But then my clients say, if I didn't change my thinking, that makes it easier. Like That feels like a load off my chest. Like if I didn't have to do all of that and change my thinking and fix my thinking, then like in practice, it's a lot lighter. It just makes our job so much easier and cleaner. That there's, I remember asking this to a client, he had like a weight off his chest. He thought that would make the world easier for me because I spend so much time in my head. It means I'd be less in my head. And there's a great quote by Michael Neal in his book, The Inside Out Revolution, which is one of my favorite books around this conversation. He says that there's nothing you can do to change your thinking quicker than to do nothing at all to change your thinking. Interesting. And we are, we, we do and it's a very counterintuitive approach to a lot of the mindset stuff. It but is. that's what's made a humongous difference to me. Yep. Mm -hmm. So when you present oh, this- Sorry, I think this is after you, Lois. 
No problem. So when you talk about this, do you talk about it with corporations? When you when you consult with corporations, or is this so something with that you corporations? Talk about? Go ahead. Sorry, I think we were cutting on each other because of the signal okay. for a second. Okay. Yes, with the corporations, it's I share this, but with a lot more practical examples, so they can see the nature behind this a little bit more that it depends with the clients and how I coach. But like there's some clients, when I coach on, on business, we might end up talking about the business plan. We might end up talking about the strategies. When I'm coaching an executive, we might talk about their brand, their positioning, their leadership skills. We might talk about making their next step. But when they tell me, for example, I'm really scared I'm going to fail. I'm really worried I'm going to fail. It can help them to, it can help to see, well, what are our, what are our thoughts made of? Do our thoughts ever tell us what's going to come up? Do our thoughts ever give us an indication of who we really are? Does it tell us that we're going to fail? And we see the made upness in the thought, which can really help anyone I coach. So I bring this in with great examples. Like when I delivered this to Parliament, I had a couple of people reaching out to me after saying it was really profound. Like they've had people come in and deliver all these tips and strategies to from your morning routines. And, and all these things are great, by the way. I do them, but it's not the answer to everything. Neither is what I'm sharing, the answer to everything either. I don't think there is an answer to everything. But because it's the same stuff, they found this really refreshing that a lot of the challenges weren't because the challenges are present in their work. They were created through their own thinking. Mm. Like they really had a glimpse that why I'm scared of uncertainty is because I've got all this story and idea about uncertainty. And they felt more relaxed that uncertainty is not the enemy. I can thrive in uncertainty if I'm not making stuff up. They saw that I've always thrived in uncertainty. Like one of my mentors, Rich Lippman, says about that, certainty is overrated. You don't need it going forwards, and you have loads of it if you look backwards. You'll see you've always overcome adversity in your career, in your work, through the challenges you're going through. Now, they may not have, things may not happen how you want, but we've got an ability to to thrive in challenge, to work through challenges. We've always done this our entire life. So I like to piece things together with stories, examples, and very real introspection that doesn't go to, as some people might describe, fluffy, but actually looks quite practical in business, that there's a way this really does work quite well when you're running a business, when you're, when you're doing whatever you're doing. Right. There's so many there's so many practical ways you can piece something like this together so that it makes sense and it lands properly. So, Reg, we have been speaking for 25 minutes already. Our time is almost up. So I have a question for you. Things we've left out, things you think our audience ought to know uh, before we close our podcast for, for this time. <clears throat> You know, I was thinking about the conversation so far. And even last week, I was delivering a workshop around this conversation to a group of entrepreneurs and executives that had gone through some challenges and are looking to perform better this year and set themselves up for the new year. And they were asking me what were two key things that really can make a difference. And the first is, as we've spoken about, that uncertainty really is our friend. And it's amazing that although we play the game of needing needing certainty sometimes we do thinking since you know certainty is a way forward actually there's no such thing as we can thrive in uncertainty and i shared the quote by reed hoffman the founder of linkedin that an entrepreneur is someone who will jump off a cliff and build their plane on the way down <laughs> and that is a great example about how this conversation works that through the year that's what we've done through the unknown we've taken one step and the next, and the next. Despite the unknown, we've taken a step and things have a way of coming together. Where Steve Jobs famously says, the dots can connect if we allow them to connect one step after the next, after the next. And what allows that to happen is the power of focus and being an essentialist. An essentialist means knowing what are your main priorities? Because so many of us today, and why we're overwhelmed is we walk into meetings and say, these are my seven priorities. The problem is you can't have seven priorities. It needs to be singular priority. And at any moment, there's only one thing that's really critical for us to do 
in our lives, in our businesses. And the more we can get present to what that is, the better our performance is because we're more in the moment. We're performing better. And that's what pieces this all together. So if there was something to do, is getting clear to out of all the things I think I need to do on my to-do list, what is really pressing right now? Like what is really important? And people might say 10 things, but it, within essentialism, what it points to is it's all the same thing. That it'll always boil down to two things, three things. And I found this for my political journey. Like right now, I'm writing a book, I'm coaching my clients, and I'm going into politics. And I can tell you there's only three things I need to do towards those right now in this moment. That's one step in each department. There's no more I need to do. I don't need to get concerned about my plans. I don't need to worry about what's to come. There's individual actions in those three that I can do that'll make a difference. And that's what helps with performance, getting very laser focused and clear and going with your own instincts, trust your instincts. And that's how it pieces like everything together for us. You know, I appreciate that right now because I think many people are struggling with that. What do we do with uncertainty? And I think your thoughts about embracing it, it's, it, it's real. And rather than being afraid of it, embracing it and moving ahead. So, Greg, thank you so much for being with us on this podcast today. And thank you for listening on Building My Legacy podcast. Thank you for watching my video. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and click the bell button above. Leave comments. We'd love to hear what you think. And visit our other social media links as well. Thanks much.